Gonna let some people roll in here for a second. And then we will begin. Okay. Going to go ahead and get my IG up and rolling. Um, so if you guys don't mind being a little patient, we will get started here very, very quickly. Uh, the email just went out to all of our, all the people on our email list. Uh, if you would like to get on that, make sure you send us an email at support at betterbeach.com. Or if you sign up for one of our free drill books, uh, that'll happen as well. But I think we are about ready to go all right welcome back to the better beach podcast my name is brandon joiner um uh, mark will unfortunately not be joining us today uh he's got some uh some work to do behind the scenes and i decided to put him to work so uh i will be covering the podcast today it's going to be very teachy you know a lot of times when we hop on here we we get to go with a conversation um with mark and i we get to banter back and forth we get to have a little bit of fun um but today obviously with it just being me will be a little bit more straightforward and just a lot of more education based um we were very fortunate enough to just get back from going to Loveland, Ohio, where Grand Sands welcomed us with open arms. Uh, we absolutely love that place. Big shout out to John Drake for uh, getting everything set up. Um, whenever we get to go back to an area, it's always really, really nice because we have a sense of a family there. You know, and um, it's it's just it's a really, really good time. It's a really, really good experience. And we get to this this whole idea that we've kind of been bringing to our camps and clinics. We realize that it's very important for us to give the information out and and help people get better at beach volleyball. But it's also centered around this idea of creating a community. And one thing that I absolutely love is whenever we get to go back to an area, we get to see familiar faces. We get to hear how people are doing in the sport. We get to he hear all these life changes and everything like that. And it, it really is just a really good time. So um, whenever we're going to an area, we hope you guys come back. It's always really great. And, and hopefully we can get something set up in Grand Sands again and uh, get to see some familiar faces once again. Uh, we do have our full week-long camp coming up in a couple weeks uh, where we are going to be heading down to St. Pete Beach and going through our week-long camp. Uh, if you haven't heard about our week-long camps before, our week-long camps are, are very, very special. It is a lot of training. I believe we have eight training sessions, which are all two and a half hours long. Uh, we have a couple tournaments thrown in there. And every single night we go out to dinner, we, we have drinks, we, we hang out, we have a lot of fun, we get to know each other. Um, and it's, it's just a really, really good introduction into what we believe in as a company. Um, so if you're, uh, we still are working our way down our wait list. We did have a couple spots open up and we we're able to hire another coach. So if you are on our wait list, make sure you keep an eye on your email and we will make sure to try to get you in there. Okay. And if not, we, uh, we're currently planning our summers around the AVP schedule and we should have a couple more openings for some camps coming up. Uh, and once again, if you want to keep, keep getting notified about these things, make sure you join our email list. Um, but today we are going to be focusing on something that I've personally been finding that has been coming, becoming a conversation over and over again at a lot of our weekend clinics and camps. 
uh, and that is how finding control can fix your game. Okay, and and this can be a very very broad spectrum of topics. It can be whether we're talking about the mental side of the game, or for me, what I'm going to be talking about a lot today is more about the idea of skills and how finding control of your body while performing certain skill sets can help fix your game or help you win more games. Um, so my plan is I'm just going to kind of run through the skills. I'm going to talk about serving. I'm going to talk about passing, setting, attacking, defense, and I'm going to give you areas where I think and I've seen personally where people tend to lose control of their bodies and the errors that come along with it and how we can fix that moving forward. OK, so I, I personally think that if you are struggling in your games, if you are frustrated with a specific skill, um, finding control of your body while performing that skill could be the fix. And a lot of the times it has to do with being patient, holding on to certain body positions and feeling comfortable with sitting a little bit longer than we expect. OK, so. Uh, if you guys have questions, make sure you put them in the chat. Uh, that's this, this session is probably going to be about 40 minutes long, and then I'll spend about 10 to 15 minutes in the chat, uh, answering some live Q and a. So if you guys have questions, make sure you, uh, put those in the chat so that when I'm, when I'm done chatting and talking and teaching, I can go back through and answer those specific questions. So here we go. Sorry, still having trouble going live on my IG, which is not a con not a surprise to a lot of you. Okay, I'm going to give up on that. All right. So uh, the first skill that I want to talk about when we're talking about finding control of your game and and thinking about what you can be doing to find that control is so when we're talking about serving. There, there's usually three different types of serves that we can that we're going to talk about. It's going to be a standing float serve, a usually a jump float serve, and then finally a top spin jump serve. Um, and all three of these, whether they are successful or not, a lot of it depends on how you feel and if you are able to control your body movements throughout the process of this skill. So with a standing float serve, we've talked about this on end, but whenever we have a standing float serve, if you are missing your standing float serve quite often, if you're getting frustrated with it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that people tend to question their strength and then that lack of confidence makes their body do things to try to find that strength rather than finding stability, you know? Uh, one of the common errors that we see when somebody is doing a standing float serve is that they tend to have this body rotation. And what I mean by that is after they serve, usually, so if you're a right-handed player, you would have your left foot at the, at the service line, and then you would have your right foot behind you kind of being a stability type of thing. And, and you're, you're going to use that back right leg to push and find power when you are making that serve. Okay. Um, the issue that we see and when people tend to start missing serve short or they lack control side to side is that this back right leg tends to rotate with your body. And people do that to try to gain strength with their serve. But whenever we do that, we tend to lose sight of the idea that that back foot is also giving us power. Okay. And so like whenever you throw a ball, you tend to lean onto that back leg and then you rotate forward, but you don't necessarily rotate your whole hips and you don't, you don't finish too early with your right foot forward. If the momentum of your body makes you have to step forward and catch yourself, that's okay. But 
we need to figure out a way to keep those legs planted as long as possible so that we can gain strength. I think if I asked every single person in the volleyball world, if you feel more balanced on two legs or one, the answer would be two legs. But for some reason, whenever we lack power and we lack, con lack confidence in our standing float serve, we tend to pick up that leg. And now we're only on one leg trying to perform a skill that requires power. And that, that's a tough position to be. So if you're a standing float server and you find yourself lacking power, try to keep both of those feet planted as long as possible. And that will allow you to find strength. Okay. If we're moving on to a jump float and a top spin serve now obviously our feet can't be planted because we're going to be moving through this contact and we're going to be using our approach to allow us to gain steam and that steam is going to create a lot of the power behind our serve okay so finding control when you're doing a moving jumps jump float or a approach with a jump top spin is it a lot of it has to do with your toss and mark put out a uh, an instagram reel yesterday um if you guys don't follow him on instagram you can go ahead and follow his uh it's just mark burke but um he did three different tosses for his serve. And this can go for whether you're doing a jump float serve or a jump top spin serve. And the one, there are three different options. One was on his left side, one was straight down the middle of his body, and one was on his right side. And from the look of it, a lot of us, I think, would pick that ball that was right down the middle because it seems like it's in the most control. But whenever we're thinking about setting ourselves up for control, being able to put your toss on your hitting shoulder is going to be very important because that's going to allow you to keep moving in a linear direction. And this is going to be a similar talk that we're going to have when we talk, when I talk about attacking, but the big issue that we see with jump float serves or jump top spin serves. And when people start to get inconsistent with them is this lack of control and it's caused because their approach turns into a zigzag or like a lightning bolt. And if that ever happens, if you guys think about it, whenever we do these type of movements, we have to slow our bodies down. We have to change directions. And whenever we're changing directions in our body, that means that we have to recollect ourselves and try to find that control again. So the fix is to keep that ball on the right side of your body. If you're a right-handed attacker, if you're a left-sided attacker, then it's the same thing, but you would just toss the ball so that it's always on your left. And the reason that this is important is it because it creates your steps in one direction. Um, I think I, one of the things that kind of, uh, when I think back to my college days, when I used to have to drive home and see my family, uh, from time to time, I would be on 95 South and I could tell what areas on the road were going to be congested and which were going to build up traffic. And those areas on the ro road always had to deal with either curves or hills. And that's a pretty well-known traffic thing, as long, unless you're in LA. But most of the time, the reason that that happens is because when we have these curves and we have these hills, cars need to accelerate and decelerate in order to kind of keep up with their control in the vehicle. It's how we feel safe. And so whenever we are doing that in an approach setting, whether it's a serve or an attack, is we need to make sure, try our best to allow either our set or our attack or our toss, sorry, to be in one linear direction because that is going to allow us to create energy going there. We're not going to have to turn. And as long as we feel like we're in control of our approach going in one direction, then the attack or the serve is going to feel more controlled. Okay. So whenever we're talking about serving very quickly, if you're doing a standing float serve, keep those feet planted. Whenever we're strong in our base, that is going to make us feel strong up top with our contact. And then when we're talking about a jump float or a jump top spin serve, 
a lot of it has to do with the toss of your approach, allowing yourselves to be in one direction. And a lot of times we tend to err on our non-hitting side because that's the natural way that our body throws a ball. So if you can think about if you're doing a jump float serve, if you're doing a jump top a jump top spin serve at practice today, really focus on having your toss finish on your attacking shoulder side, even if it's a foot or two outside of your body, because at least you will allow yourself to create a linear approach, getting yourself to the ball. And if you haven't done a jump top spin or a jump float serve before, I recommend staying with a four step approach. Okay. It's going to feel very similar to a, an attack for you with a jump float serve. You should be taking a right, left toss the ball on that hitting shoulder and then finish with those two aggressive right, left, making a solid contact. All right. With the top spin serve, you're going to use that toss and that timing step or that right. And then you're going to make the toss on your hitting shoulder, air on your hitting shoulder. And then you will be allowed to use the rest of your approach, that left, right, left to get up and make a very powerful approach. Okay. So that's a quick little overview of serving. If you have any questions about serving, make sure you put it in the, in the chat right now. Um, I will come back to it in a little bit. Uh, passing. Okay. Passing is probably one of the bigger things that I've seen it on, especially it's the easiest one for us to lose control and lose. And when I say control, I mean body control. And it's something that I've been focusing a lot on our clinics. And to be completely honest, it's been the easiest way for me to make fixes to people's passing. And the very simple fix is that I want them to hold their finish, not only with their feet, but also their platform. I've talked about this on end about how I think holding your finish, whether we're talking about passing, setting, attacking, serving, I've talked about how I think it is one of the more important things that you can do in the sport, especially when you're at training, um, because we have a little bit of extra time. Most of the time when you're training, you don't have to run through and think about the next touch. But a lot of the times that's when errors occur. We think about, oh, I just passed the ball. Now it's time to hit. And we, we release ourselves from that pass a little too quickly. So the common mistakes that we see with passing has to do with our lower body not being able to hold our strength throughout the process of a pass. And the way that we see this is if you end up in a lunge position, so a lot of the times coaches will teach for you to have one foot slightly forward, but that's a really dangerous area to be because if you end with one foot forward, then that's where your body starts to wiggle back and forth. And the wider that your stance gets with that front foot being forward, the more unstable you can be. Uh, I, once again, if I went back to the volleyball community and I asked if you feel more comfortable and more powerful doing a squat versus a lunge, I think a lot of us would say that we feel more comfortable doing a squat. But for some reason, Instead of using footwork that allows our feet to be next to each other and find that strength, we tend to put ourselves into a lunge position where now we're wavering back and forth. And if it's a wind, a big wind gust comes along, then we might even get blown over from that. Okay. So we, we commonly use a three-step approach when we're talking about passing. And if you can think about your starting position, we normally just have people bend over, put their hands on their knees with their feet about shoulder width apart. And then wherever you are going on the court, you should be able to get there in three steps. And those steps should be a step in the direction of the play and then a hop hop. And the reason that we do a step and then a hop hop or a plant plant is because that plant allows us to be stable and strong. Uh, we use a very similar idea when we're approaching because we want to get up and hit.
But if we didn't allow ourselves to go with those last two aggressive steps on our approach, we wouldn't be able to find power and get up in the air. So it's really important when we're in serve receive for us to really commit to finding the strength on both of our legs. The common error that we see is that people rotate through their pass a lot. And what that looks like is whenever they're passing, one of their feet will come off the ground or for some people, both feet leave the ground. So a, a very easy fix for everybody watching is whenever you are passing the ball today or this week at practice, try to think about were my feet able to stay planted on the ground throughout the process of my pass? I can almost guarantee you that if you answer yes to that question, then more than likely you will be able to make a, a good pass, okay? If you feel like you've shanked a ball, you shank it off the court, you didn't quite get there early enough, then more than likely, your one of your feet or possibly both of your feet were not planted during the pass. And this is a really, really easy thing to look at when you record yourself playing, All right? It is very, very funny to me. Every single time I go to a clinic or a camp, I'll have somebody go and I'll ask if they're okay with me taking a video of them. I'll record them taking, I'll record them passing a ball and then I'll show them what I'm talking about. And a lot of times people don't even realize that they're doing this. So if you do not record yourself playing in games, you need to make sure that you're doing that because it will point out some flaws or some inefficiencies that you do that you probably don't even realize that you're doing yet. So that's why we always strongly suggest making sure that you record yourself. And when you're recording yourself passing, if you're able to pass the ball and the ball leaves your arms, let's say by four feet and your feet still haven't moved, that's a really strong, stable base. That's how you find the control within the pass. If you are constantly having to reset your feet after a pass or you're rotating through, you're falling over, then your feet are probably not in a very good location to start the play. Whenever uh, a lot of people tend to fight me on this and not fight me, but they tend to argue a little bit and question whether or not a lot of times they're like, I, I don't feel like I'm there. And a lot of the times that has to do with us being too anxious rather than too slow. You know, a lot, a lot of times whenever we're talking about people who question their tracking of the ball, a lot of us get really, really anxious. And right when that serve gets served, we tend to try to guess where the ball is going and we try to beat the ball to the spot by being before the ball. But we need to think about putting ourselves in a position so that when we know where that ball is going, we can use that three-step approach to get to the spot on the court where we are going to be strong and stable when we're passing. If we leave too early, then we're probably going to be heading in the wrong direction. And if we're heading in the wrong direction, it's going to be very hard to be stopped and stable. You know, I, I commonly use the idea, if I, if I was talking to Mark and I called him real quick and I was like, hey man, let's go grab lunch. I'll call you in five minutes and let you know where we're going. He wouldn't get in his car and start driving around hoping that he's heading in the right, right location for us to have lunch. No, he would probably be patient at his house. He would, he, he would probably get dressed and start his day and everything like that, but he wouldn't get in the car. All right. We need to think about that whenever we're passing as well. When that ball is in the server's hands, we can start to prep. We can start to get ready. We can start to get dressed. But really all we're doing is we're getting and we're anticipating what the other side of the net is going to look like. We're anticipating when that ball is going to be hit by the server. And then once we see the direction that the ball is heading, we can use that step plant plant with our feet to get behind the ball and that is how you track a serve, okay? We can't jump ahead of this step and just try to beat the ball there because that's where you put yourself into a bad spot. That's where you lose your balance through the play, and that's where you feel like a lot of times 
you feel like you're getting hit high on your neck because you have put yourself into the wrong position, even though you got there very quickly. So we need to remember that it's okay to be relaxed and serve receive. And then we need to commit to using the proper footwork and get to that position. All right. Another thing to think about is finding control before that first movement happens. Okay. We talk a lot about shape when, whenever we're passing and what that shape should feel like is if you put your hands on your knees, if you're at home and you want to stand up real quick and you put your hands on your knees and then you drop your hands. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to think about curving or doing like a crunch with your abs and tucking that bottom rib. Or if you know what a xiphoid process is or like your middle of your chest, if you want to think about pushing that chest in, that should round and open up your shoulders. And this kind of shape is what we're trying to hold on to throughout the process of our pass. So a lot of us, whenever that serve gets hit in the air, it's higher than the net, obviously. We are below the net. So we tend to watch it with our whole body. And we have this hip hinge forward making ourselves stand up and then we have to track this ball and try to find this position again that i was just talking about with our our chest caved in and our back rounded sitting back into our pass but if we can just hold on to that body shape throughout the movements of our pass and then we're able to stick the landing on our plant plant with our foot movement then that's where we are, we're able to find control within our bodies. And it doesn't make us feel like we have to be doing too much with our platform, with our legs to make this pass happen. Whenever you are strong and stable, this ball tends to bounce off of you a little bit more because you are the strength. You're the body position that you need to be in. And whenever that's the case, the ball likes that. The ball tends to bounce a little bit more. So we need to think, uh, I've said it a couple of different ways. Um, one of the ways that I've, I've been talking about it recently is that if you are a beginner, you need to get away from this idea of making passing a verb. Okay. And what I mean by, I know passing is a verb. I, my mom was an English teacher. Um, I know it's an action. But a lot of us make it an extreme action where we have a lot of leg movement. We have a lot of arm movement. And whenever we have all these extra movements, it's really hard to time things up and make the play look controlled. So we need to limit those things. All right. And if we can make passing more focused on our bodies being an object that the ball is going to bounce off of then I think that's going to set ourselves up for a lot more success in the passing realm. Because now all we have to think about, if we can create our object, our bodies in a position on the court where the ball is coming to, and it's able to bounce off of our platform, now we can start thinking about this idea of, okay, I need to give it a couple more feet of height rather than I need to get this ball and I need to somehow put it into the middle of the court. And that, that whenever we start making goals like that, we start to add a lot of extra movements into our passing. So we have to figure out a way to eliminate those. If you can think about accepting this ball coming into you, turning your body a little bit, creating an angle that the ball bounces off of and goes to the setting location, and then your body movements give that ball a foot or two of height or take a foot or two off of the height based on how hard the serve is, then that's how you control your pass. Okay. If you are taking it completely on yourselves to push this ball or swing at this ball to make it go to your location, um, then I think that that's a problem. A good drill that I do with people that are having this issue is I actually tell them that I want them to pass the ball low. I want them to con concentrate on the angle of their platform. So uh, if, if you want to do this at practice today, when have somebody toss a ball to you, do not worry about the height of the ball 
and just create an angle, get your base completely locked in so that your feet are like cemented to the ground. And then when the ball bounces off of your platform, you find the angle so that it just goes towards the setter spot. Doesn't even have to make it there. And then as the round increases, you can start adding a little bit of power rep after rep allowing yourselves to find how much energy you actually need to be putting into this ball to find a perfect pass. I think a lot of us are a little confused on how much we need to be doing because this ball create has a lot of energy on it when we're serving. So as a passer, a lot of times I don't need to do much. I can have very minimal movements. And if I can keep those movements minimal, then that's going to help me feel like I'm more in more control. So uh, passing is definitely something where control can be it can be a huge huge help to making you feel feel more controlled. So whenever you're passing, three things that I want you to focus on: one, get your feet planted and keep them planted throughout your pass. Two. Make sure that you are trying to keep the shape of your body throughout the movement and throughout the process of your pass. And then three, try to be simple. Try to make this ball do as much of the work as possible. And then if you need to add a, a little bit of extra love to the ball, you can. But that movement should be four to six inches. When a lot of the times, especially as levels go down, we tend to see that movement being somewhere between one and two feet. And that's, that's a really dangerous area to live. Okay, so um, we want to make sure that our movements are small. So be simple. Okay. Moving on to setting. Setting is going to be very, very similar to our passing. A lot of us forget that our feet are the most important thing when we're setting. Obviously, if you're a bump setter, then you tend to focus a little bit more on your legs. But if you're a hand setter, then a lot of the times we completely forget that our feet are important. Um, and one of the big issues with this is that we see a lot of hand setters falling to the ground when they're setting. Um, yes, it looks cool. But the reason that we're doing that is because we have put ourselves in a position that our body doesn't like and we have to rotate through this ball and we tend to find our balance by picking our feet up and falling to the ground in order to remain controlled with the play. But the goal should always be, uh, whenever we're talking about our setting footwork and our setting technique, when you release to the net, <clears throat> you should be finishing with your off foot and then your net foot and then making a set. And so the reason that we use that is because you're going to be changing sides. So if you are a left side player, then you should be finishing right foot and then your left foot to make the set. If you're on the right side, just switch it. Your net foot is now going to be your right leg. So you should be finishing left, right. And whenever we're making that left, right, once again, kind of a similar topic when we were talking about our uh our standing float serve is that we want to try to maintain strength with both of those steps okay whether we're talking about a bump set or a hand set is a lot of times people tend to stumble through these last two steps and if you're stumbling through these last two steps then you do not have control of your lower body and we're asking ourselves to be perfect with a touch with our upper body. We have to find strength with our lower body before we can find strength with our upper body. So uh, one reason that this happens a lot is that setters tend to leave way too late. Okay, so once you see that that ball is not coming to you, you can go ahead and relax. You don't have to pass. So you can stand up and start trotting forward, maybe two or three steps. All right. And then once you see that pass, you can continue, continue your steps so that your momentum carries you through this touch. And what I mean by that is if you think about where you are going to be touching the ball and where your attacker is going to be touching the ball, 
your body should be moving through that touch. Okay. A lot of the times what happens is we put ourselves into a position to where when we are making our touch, our feet aren't able to stay on the ground. And even worse, we end up taking steps backwards. Okay. So we have to make sure that our feet are stable. We are not only doing that off foot net foot set, but when we do it, we're able to hold that finish and hold that control. Once again, if you do your off foot and then your net foot, and then you make your set and the momentum of your body makes you move that back foot forward, that's okay. But a lot of the times what we see is that people are running through this set or they're moving away from where they are setting the ball. And we need to make sure that whenever we're doing that, we find strength in our lower body and our upper body, and we're keeping our momentum going towards our attacker. Most of the time, after you're done making a set, you should be covering your attacker anyway. So it kind of makes sense, not kind of, it makes sense that after you make this set, you should still be moving in the direction of your attacker because you still have a job to do. So if you're one of those people that pushes away whenever you're making set and you set backwards all the time, not only are you losing a lot of power, but you're also not finishing your play. So for setting, Make sure that you're putting yourselves in a position so that you can continually move through this set while finding strength, okay? You shouldn't just be running through this set to go cover your attacker. It should still be off foot, net foot, set. My feet are still stable. Okay, now I have to step forward because my momentum is, I'm about to fall, okay? So you're rocking forward onto that net foot, and eventually you've, you've moved so far forward that you have to catch yourself with that back leg like you're walking, okay? Um, if we're able to do that and you're able to find that strength, then that's when you set yourself up for success. If you don't feel like your feet are underneath you, one, you shouldn't be hand setting in the first place, but two, you're going to feel the same struggles whether you're a bump setter or a hand setter, okay? The second reason that a lot of times we get out of control with our bodies as a setter is because our passers tend to pass in the wrong location. Uh, the easiest way for me to see improvement of our setting when and our passing when I'm at a drill when I'm at a clinic or a camp is that I draw a line straight down the middle of the court on both sides of the net and I tell players that whenever they touch a ball they have to keep the ball on their half of the court. Okay. I, whenever we set up and serve receive position, obviously we're splitting the court with our partner, but the biggest issue that we commonly see is that people tend to pass the ball on the, onto their partner's half thinking that that's where they should pass because that's going to help their partner. But all that does is encourage them to be moving away from their set or away from you as an attacker when they're creating that set. So the whole thing that I just talked about where you should be moving through the set and you should be making your touch and then going towards your attacker, you are setting them up for failure when you pass that ball into their half of the court, because now more than likely they're thinking that you're going to pass in front of you. But now you're having to backpedal away from this ball to make the set. So passers, pass the ball in front of you on your half of the court. In an ideal situation, you pass it right on that midline. But even that position will allow your setter to continually move into that set. All right. If you happen to err on your half of the court by passing straight in front of you, that's still okay. Setters are really good about running forwards, but we hate running backwards. So passers, you can also help your setter and help with their momentum by making sure that you are always passing in front of them. Uh, this is something that I always talk about, whether I'm in transition, whether I'm in serve receive, if I feel like I'm out of control and my passer's passing me too far on my half of the court, I'll let them know very quickly. Hey, pass it more straight up and down. Pass it in front of you so that I can move in and you can make my job a little bit easier. I think that that will clean up the game. 
So I was working with a group of girls this past weekend in Ohio, and I drew this line, and it was unbelievable how quickly their court rose a level just because of how much control they had with their first touch, allowing that control to be there with their second touch. And now they're actually getting the, the chance to attempt a swing rather than just feeling like the ball is getting bounced around and, and trying to get three touches before we send it over the net. So I think uh, passers, you have a job. You have a responsibility to keep that ball in front of your setter so that they can continually move forward. And then setters, you have a job to make sure that you are putting yourself into a position so that when you make this set, you can keep your momentum going towards your attacker. And it's a very easy thing to see if you're recording yourself play after your set, where does your step, where does your next step go? If it goes towards the attacker, more than likely your strength was in the right spot. Your movements were in the right spot and the set was probably pretty good. If your movements are away from you or to the side or something like that, then that's where our sets start to get inconsistent or even if it is a good set, it's because you forced that ball to go to the right spot. So you did your job as a setter, but you didn't do your job as an athlete to get behind the ball. Okay. And those are very, two very different things. So it's okay to be a great volleyball player and make really good plays, but you're going to make your job easier if you set yourself up into the right position. Okay. Attacking. All right. I'm going to try to go a little bit quicker with this. Um, but because a lot of the times, it, or if you were here earlier in the show and I talked about serving, especially when I was talking about a jump spin, it, it's very, very similar. And it, a lot of it has to do with making your approach linear. Excuse me. And whenever we talk about attacking, we tend to focus on the same ideas where after you pass, it's your job to set yourself up into your hitting corridor. That's what we call it. Um, that's where the way I was taught it. My coach in college, Fred Chow, uh, he would very, very often refer to this area as your hitting corridor. The McKibbins have a great video called the batter's box. It is the same thing. It is the same idea. Um, and it is crucial into you becoming a good attacker. So if you do not understand this idea of finding your hitting corridor, what you are doing is pretty much after you pass, you are moving to a location so that your setter has a bigger window of setting your attacking shoulder. Okay, so if I'm a left side player and I'm right-handed, after I would make a pass, I would shuffle away from my setter because that creates a bigger distance between my setter and my, my starting position as an attacker for my right shoulder to get set. Okay, if you stay still after you pass, especially if you're passing in front of you like we want you to, if you pass in front of you, now this setter's window gets really, really small. And more than likely, they're going to be pushing that ball to your left side, even though you're right-handed. And this is the same idea as what we're thinking about when we're driving, or now your approach is finding those bent or lightning bolt shapes is because when you are doing your approach, you're thinking that your setter is going to set the ball so that you can hit it, but they're trying their best. And more than likely, this ball is going to drift a little bit. So what tends to happen is now your approach is going forward, but at the last second, you're having to change your approach to go further outside, which makes you lose all of your momentum. It makes you lose all of your vision. And now this ball is attacking you rather than you attacking it. Okay. So once again, if you're on the left side of the court, you should be bumping away from your setter so that if they happen to miss inside of you, you can have a linear approach to go get that ball. If they happen to push it, and now it's going to land straight in front of you, you still have the ability to have a linear approach to go get that ball and use your momentum to go hit that swing. Okay, so if you're thinking about recording yourself for, for attacking purposes, put the, put the camera right behind you in serve receive or right behind you where, wherever you would shuffle to in an ideal situation <clears throat> and see 
if your approach is in one line or if it tends to zigzag and try to go up, uh, you're chasing the ball. Okay. Uh, we want this attack to feel like you are going in one direction because that's how we gain steam. That's how we gain momentum. And if we have momentum going in toward last two steps of our approach, allowing us to get up high, then that's where we're going to find the optimal power of our swing. And it's not just going to rely on our shoulders. Okay. So if you have shoulder issues, more than likely your approach is a little funky. All right. If, if you're looking for more power, then make sure you find that timing step on the setter's contact. And then think about this linear approach going towards the net and using it to take off. Okay. An another analogy that I can use is if you think about airplanes, when they are going to take off, there's a runway, a very long runway where they are going completely straight. They're gaining steam, they're gaining speed, and then they take off. It's the same exact thing when you're doing approach. We don't see an airplane driving down a runway, doing all these turns and then taking off. It, it's, it, it's just not how it works. So whenever we're attacking, we need to be airplanes. We need to think about setting ourselves up so that we have this runway and hopefully if you shuffle away from your attacker or you open up your attacking shoulder, then you are, you're making your runway bigger. So that's a real, I really, really like that, that image that I, at least it makes sense in my mind. Hopefully it makes sense out there. But if you create that hitting corridor and you, you give your setter more room to error on your attacking side, then you are making your runway bigger, which means that you're going to be able to stay in that straight line to go attack this ball. If you're on the right side of the court and you're a right-handed hitter, then instead of bumping away, you need to bump in so that this set can pass over your right side. And once again, we can keep that approach as linear as possible, allowing yourselves to go in one direction and not do these zigzaggy type approaches. So that's how you find control with your approach. A lot of the times we, especially if you don't feel like you have control of your approach, it's because you're running at the net. And if you're early and you're not setting up your hitting corridor, then you're going to be chasing this set and you're going to be running from side to side. And that is not the way you want to be when you're trying to perform a powerful skill of jumping. You want to be moving within, if you set up your runway, when you start that approach, you should try to stay within a two to three foot zone or a two to three foot runway as you're going to approach. And we have to wait back long enough to see where that set is going to land before we continue our approach. Too many of us rely on ourselves to go up and try to get this ball and hope that the set is going to be there. You need to wait, you need to be patient so that you can see this set, allow that set to be in your runway that you created after you saw it, and then make that momentum and that approach linear to go get it. Okay. Um, I think offense is a pretty good uh, stopping point for today. Um, I will take a couple questions. I don't see too many right now. Hopefully that means because I did a good job explaining. But um, if you guys have any questions, doesn't matter what it's about, doesn't matter if it relates to today or not, I'm going to hang out for about 10 to 12 minutes uh, if you guys have questions and just answer. But um, as you guys type out those questions, in short, the easiest way for you to get better at a specific skill is to find yourself find body control within yourself before you think about the result of your play. You know, I think a lot of us, we get blinded by results and it's really hard not to in this day and age because we're judged so much. But um, if you can think about, so instead of thinking about, I have to get this ball to the setter's position as a passer, change that idea and say, I have to get my last two steps stable before I make this pass. And I can almost promise you, if you are able to get those feet stable, I'm not saying that it's going to be a perfect pass every time, 
but you're going to start to understand what you did wrong before the touch happened. Okay. Uh, if we're not stable and we can't hold a position after the pass happens, we can't analyze ourselves and we can't be like, oh, my angle was off or, oh, my, my touch on my platform, the ang it was too early. Okay. So whatever skill you're thinking about, if it's a serving, standing float serve, think about were my feet stable? Was I able to keep my feet on the ground? Okay. With passing, same thing. When I made my pass, was I able to hold my strength? Was I able to hold this body position with my pass? Was I able to keep both of my feet planted on the ground after I made my pass? Okay, with, with setting, is my momentum going towards my target? Am I setting myself up for stability throughout my touch? And then attacking, is that approach linear? Do I feel like I'm going in one direction? Do I feel powerful? Uh, and if you can answer yes to those questions, more than likely the play is going to be good. And if you can't answer yes to that question, then it's going to help you out. It's going to help you figure out where the issue was and where you lost that strength. And I, I think that that's a really, really big key. It's something I've really been focusing on in our clinics and camps. And it's for me, it's one of the easiest and quickest changes that I see in the sport. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that little talk. Um, it it truly has been a pleasure of mine focusing on it recently because uh, a lot of times I get bogged down with how to make touches. So it's it's really nice to kind of switch up my point of view a little bit and see people focusing on just finding strength because I think that that's something that a lot of us can accomplish a lot easier than making a good pass. You know, so if we can make these small little goals like I've talked about in the past, then that's how you get better at beach volleyball. So, all right, we got some questions running in. So, all right, Tim or Mark first. Uh, love the point of dividing the court in half, forcing the movement of the setting into the set. Thanks. I'm not joking. If you're a coach, if you're a player, uh, if you're finding that your set is inconsistent or you're just not able to set up an offensive design, Create this line on the court and make yourself pass on your half of the court. It, it will blow your mind how quickly it will make your game feel like it's in control. And it allows the setters to understand where they should be going. And if setters know where they're going, they feel more confident making the set. So make sure you do that. Um, always appreciate you, Mark. Thanks for coming again. Uh, Tim, are you hitting up the AVP stop here in Virginia Beach? You know I will never miss an opportunity to come back home. Um, you guys can go ahead and guarantee, I guarantee you I will be there. Um, I love going back home to Virginia beach. So hopefully I can see all you guys. Uh, hopefully you guys come out and cheer me on. Um, I'm expecting a pretty solid season for myself and would love to perform. And obviously I always love playing in front of friends and family. So, uh, I will see you guys in Virginia beach. Mark, again, what are the top three drills for serve receive? How much of a squat and freeze of your platform do you recommend? Um, top three drills that I, I suggest, uh, we have one drill that I call six-legged monster, where there are six areas on the court that you have to go to. So it would be a short left, a short right, straight to the right, straight to the left, and then back to the right and back to the left. And I, I love this idea because, and it would just be a person at the net tossing to those locations, making the passer move to that location. And the reason that I like it is because it really allows the passer to focus on the correct footwork and finding strength at the end of their pass. A lot of times we convince ourselves that we can't, we can't cover the whole court, but I think everybody, everybody that does this drill realizes very quickly that the court is not as big as we make it seem. So if we're able to use that correct footwork, find that strength and make that pass, then it's just muscle memory, getting really good at it and finding a way, seeing that serve, oh, it's going short left, find that correct footwork. So it allows you to work on finding all of those locations, practicing all the footwork and getting stopped. Um, you can do the same thing with a serve on the other side of the net. Um, and I think pretty much any drill that makes you stay in that 
that body posturing position is going to set your team up for success. So I, I really like that. I anything with a serve, we're moving locations. Um, really, just any type of drill that makes people focus on correct footwork, and then finding a way to do that correct footwork to any ball that comes onto to their side. So uh, if you look up Six Legged Monster in our library, if you're a member or on YouTube, uh, you should be able to find that. Okay, how, and then the second part of your question, how much of a squat and freeze of your platform do you recommend? Um, what, if, I'm, if I'm trying to fix control and body issues, I tell people that they should, especially if they're not playing out the point, that they should try to hold their platform, at one, until their partner catches the ball. And that should be them holding their body positioning, holding their finish of their platform. So it's almost like free stag. When that ball leaves their arms, they should freeze. All right, and if there's if there's just a catch, then they can do it until the partner catches the ball. If it's a live play, I usually try to tell them to hold the hold their touch for a second or two, um, because even if we do that, we still have time to go hit. Uh, a lot of us don't realize that we have that much time. So um, I would say, in a perfect world, we'll do it for a second or two. A second is probably the more realistic answer, but a second after the contact takes place or until the peak of the pass. All right, Mason. All right, hi, Brandon. Hello, Mason. Got a question for you if you got time. How do you train with weights or bands in order to reduce the amount of time it takes to initiate your arm swing? Um, I, I spend a lot of time at pretty much every single workout that I do, uh, every training session that I do, I do pre-work with bands. Um, a lot of times this has to do with exercises like I's, Y's, and T's. If you don't know what those are, uh, it has all to do with what your body looks like. So I's would be, you would lay down on the ground with your face on the floor and then you would extend your arms above you. And then you're just going to pull your arms up into the air. Those are called eyes. All right. And then if you if you have any of those small bands, um, I think I might have one right here. Uh, I don't know where they are. Um, if you have any of those small circular bands, then you can put them around yourself, uh, around your wrists and create a little bit of tension while you're doing those eyes. Y's, you would just be doing a Y kind of like the YMCA. Okay. T's are when you're going to be completely out to your side, still laying on the ground. And you can do this with two variations where your thumbs are going to be facing the sky. And then ones where your, your thumbs are going to be facing the ground. And you're just trying to pinch your back while keeping your arms straight. Obviously, you can't use the band when you're doing that one, but you can use the band for your eyes and Y's. Um, but uh, we have a phenomenal course, Mason, called How to Fix Your Arm Swing in 10 Days. Um, and if you are interested in checking that out, uh, you can either join the membership or you can shoot us an email at support at betterbeach.com. We'll get you hooked up with that course. Um, it, it gives you a lot of ideas as far as pre-work that you should be doing before every, before every practice, before every workout. And it takes you through some drills to really help strengthen your shoulder. So uh, shoot us an email um, and we'll, we'll get you in, in touch with uh, that that product of how to fix your arm swing in 10 days. I think it, for the question that I'm seeing you write, uh, that course alone could help you out a lot. I'm going to make control be the theme of this week's practice. Thank you. I love it. I let me know how it goes, Mark. Um, I, I think that it, and if you have any questions along the way, shoot me a DM, shoot me an email. Let me know if what you got. Okay. Greg, can you, Restate the optimal location for a passer on serve received to pass the ball. Six feet off the net, midline between you and your partner, six feet above the antenna. Yeah. So, Greg, uh, thank you for asking this question. Um, we at Better at Beach, we have come up with the number six. Okay. We like that number when we're passing because we think that you should be passing the ball in the middle of the court. All right. If you're going to error, Error on your half of the court. I've spent a lot of time talking about that today. So we want to make sure that people are doing that. 
And then you want to pass the ball six feet off the net. And that might seem far, but the reason that we stay six feet off the net is because in most situations, if you are anywhere from 10 feet to two feet from the net, then you are going to be able to make an in-system set. Okay, so we put that number at six because if you happen to miss a little tight, you're still able to make a good set. If you happen to miss a little off, you're still able to make that set as well. So we really like that six feet off the net. And then we try to go six feet above the top of the antenna because that will give your setter enough time to get to the ball. Um, for me, and this might be different for Mark, it might be different for other coaches, I personally think that we can err on the lower side of this to where we're operating any, but as long as the pass is above the top of the antenna, I think the setter is going to be able to make a very good play on the ball. Uh, if we get up to 10 feet above the top of the antenna, I think that puts a lot of stress on our setters. And if we get the ball below the top of the antenna, that puts a lot of stress on our setters as well as far as movement. So um, I really like those, the six feet off the net, six feet above the antenna. Um, and then midline of the court, but error on your half. Okay. I figured always good to see you, Tim. Couldn't agree more, man. Can't wait to see you guys in Virginia Beach. Simon, any tips to avoid taking a false backward step when I'm trying to move forward? Uh, Simon, I'm assuming that you're talking about in serve receive. Um, one, your starting position might be avoid taking a false step backwards. Um, make sure your starting position is at a point, I would say about three quarters away from the net as far as where your starting position should be. Um, and then it sounds like you're, I'm not sure if you're here for the beginning of the talk, but when I was talking about passing, sometimes what we do is we leave too early. Okay. And you want to make sure that you find this balance in, in your, uh, in your legs so that once you see where the ball is going, you can make sure that your first step is powerful. If your first step is backwards, then more than likely either the weight is back on your body. So you might be watching the ball go too high when it's served, making yourself have to step back because you're changing the balance of your body. If you can focus on keeping that shape, wait to see where the direction of the ball is going, allow yourself to stand up a little bit and serve receive. You might be a little too low. And then once you see that that ball is served, then you can think about making the correct step. And as you get more comfortable with that step, plant, plant, finish on your serve receive, you're going to make your muscle memory is going to take over and you're going to stay balanced. You're going to be able to keep that shape and then you're going to be able to find that strength throughout your pass as well. Um, Simon, that might be a, another good one to record and just see what your body looks like before you're making that step, because more than likely you're putting yourself into a position where it has to step backwards. Not that you're doing it out of concern or, or just because you have to. Okay. Um, so that would be a good thing to record and see what your body is doing. And maybe you're leaving too early. Maybe you're standing up too much, but it's hard to, it's hard to tell without seeing. Okay. Eric, can you give us any advice with mental strength and stressful games when the pressure is high, like if you're in a rut and need to maintain focus? You know, I, I think every athlete is battling this and um, it's way easier said than done. But I think that this is really where small goals come into effect. Um, whenever we get thinking about winning or losing, uh, that's when stress starts to come up. And unfortunately, uh, for some people, it happens quicker than others. It happens at different magnitudes. Um, but the worst part is that we create that within ourselves. And so I think one, being able to understand that you are out there because you put yourself there is a big thing. And then realizing that you can make an accomplishable goal that will help your mental state. So this is where I really try to focus on if I'm in a high pressure pressure situation, I'm not thinking, oh, I have to score this point. 
this is where I'm, I'm talking to myself about these small goals. I have to get my feet stopped on this pass. I have to create a good angle for my platform. I have to keep my shape throughout my pass. And those little goals are a lot easier to accomplish. And when we accomplish those goals, it gives us a sense of confidence. And once we start to get confidence, that's when we start playing better. So I think if this is a really good opportunity, um, we, we could spend a whole month of our podcast talking about mental strength. And I, I think that that's probably a good idea because a lot of people struggle with it. Um, but I think the quickest thing that I can think of right now is, is give yourself smaller goals in those moments that you can accomplish, which hopefully will give you more, give you more, give you more confidence. And if you have more confidence, I, I guarantee you'll start playing better. Nicole, when the ball gets passed on the other half of the court and I have to back up as a setter, how do I avoid pushing the ball too far away from me? One, realize that it's your job to do that with your feet and not your platform. Okay, A lot of us, whenever we feel this motion going backwards, we tend to swing our arms a lot. But even if the ball is passed behind us, we still need to try to get ourselves into a position so that we're going off foot, net foot set and moving through this set. If you're not able to do that because the pass is so far behind you, then you just have to try to hold on to your strength as long as you can. And this is where we see a lot of setters falling to the ground because they're not falling because they're unathletic or they're not falling because they're lazy. They're falling because they're holding their strength as long as they possibly can until they make the set. Okay, so uh, one, I would say really focus on getting behind this ball so that you can continue that momentum going towards your attacker. And, and realize that you, that momentum, getting that ball through the ball or getting your momentum to go through the ball towards your attacker, that's going to mean that you do not have to swing your arms as much as I'm assuming that you are. Um, once again, this is another thing that's a lot easier to see. But if you do feel that momentum going away from you, then just really focus on your attacker's hitting shoulder. You know, it's not your job to get the ball to the left antenna or the right antenna, depending on what side you're playing. Your goal is to find your attacker's hitting shoulder and leave the ball on that attacker's hitting shoulder. So it's okay to leave the ball inside. But one thing that we don't like to see is we don't like to see our attacker running away from us. Or if I'm a left side attacker running away from us so that that ball is landing on my non-hitting shoulder because that just takes all the power away. So I would say one, focus on your momentum. Two, err on missing on your attacker's shoulder. Um, and obviously the ball always needs to land inside the court in that situation as well. So if I'm a right hand, a right side player and I'm right-handed, we don't want that ball landing 10 feet outside the line. Focus on getting it to my hitting shoulder, but also realize that there are limitations to that. Okay, Rick Swan. I like that name. Rolls off the tongue. Hi, Brandon. I have a couple of guys I am coaching that are good players, but I have a habit of rising up to meet the ball almost like almost like going up on their toes. Platform is up and out and frozen, but they rise their whole body. They were taught the last couple of years to always pass midline. Um, yeah, th this is where I think that shape is important. So once again, Rick, if you weren't here, um, the shape that you're trying to get is if you are get into that passing position and then push your xiphoid process or like just below your chest cavity, if you push that up, then it makes you round your, your back. So you can kind of see it on the camera. You can see how I'm having to tilt my head forward because I'm caving my chest in. And I would just tell them to focus on keeping that shape throughout the process of the pass. Don't even allow them to go hit yet. Make them keep that shape throughout the pass and make them feel power in their legs still. If I had to guess, a lot of these guys probably pass the ball too high, probably pass the ball 10 feet above the antenna in some situations because they're without even knowing they're, they're doing a leg extension and an arm extension when they're making this pass. But just because we get the ball to the location doesn't mean that it's a good pass. 
we have to find a soft peak. We don't want it to be a really noticeable peak. Um, and I think the shape of our body makes us keep that. So uh, this is a great opportunity for you to record. And I would do it from a side vision. So just on the side of them and make sure that they keep this rounded back shape throughout the process of the pass. If they let their hips come forward and their platform comes into their body, that's either where they're putting their feet down in the wrong location or they're not thinking about keeping their hips backwards or they're not thinking about the angle of their platform. So uh, I think a lot of that can get focused. Can The focus can be keeping their shape. And then maybe you set a goal to where their head stays at the bottom of the net or something like that. So they, they don't do the stand up at the end. Um, but I think recording and showing them what looks right and what doesn't, and then having them feel what that feels like is a really easy way to accomplish that. All right. I got time for one more question. Uh, sorry, Rick. I just saw you commented again. Uh, they play a lot of indoor as well. So they were taught to pass high middle. Yeah. I, I think it, it's just making, convincing them that that high, really high middle pass is, is not something that we want to see on the sand. Um, make, maybe, and this is a conversation that I, I have with some people is it, maybe you want to force them to pass lower for, for a week so that they can see what, what their body form needs to be. A lot of times when, whenever we concentrate on passing high, uh, we tend to add in these more movements because we need to find power somehow. And the easiest way to do that is with a hip hinge going forward. So uh, I think that that's concentrating on just keeping their shape, keeping that lowness. So uh, keeping their head low and not bobbing up and down is a really, really good place to start. Okay. And then Paul, this will be my last question. How does the step plant plant work if you're passing a short ball? Okay. I find myself just running towards the net. So oh, Paul, you called me or sorry, Raul. Um, Raul, you, you, you called me out and I appreciate it. The footwork is going to change a little bit. Okay. So whenever we do float, whenever we do short serves, more than likely we have to find a way to get be beneath this ball and stay beneath the ball. So the way that you would do this is you would do a step still in the same direction, a step in the direction of the play, another step. So now we're getting rid of that plant plant, another big step. And then we're going to go into a lunge. Okay. With, so if you're moving to your left side, your left foot should finish forward. Okay. And I'm actually going to be posting uh, a video on my Instagram reels this week about this topic. So, um, Raul, if you don't follow me already, it's our, it's at the bottom of the page. Um, and I think that that would be a really good thing for you to look at, but we want to make sure that we're staying below. So it turns into a step and then kind of jumping into this lunge position so that your outside leg is forward. Um, and if you're able to do that and have your feet underneath you, then that will allow you to rise up with the pass. You're, you're still able to find that shape and strength with your body. Um, but the footwork is going to change a little bit. We just want to make sure that we're still setting ourselves up to find a stable base when we're passing. Um, if we just run towards the net and try to bend at the hip and try to get this ball, then that's where you're going to find yourself out of control and swinging your platform a lot to try to get this ball. So we want to try to stay underneath the ball. So with the, each of those steps, you should be dropping lower. And then finally, when you kick into that lunge with either your left foot or your right foot forward, depending on where you're going, hopefully you're still able to kind of be forward with your chest forward and your shoulders down to make that pass. Uh, hopefully that kind of makes sense. All right, guys, great questions today. Absolutely loved them. Um, and a lot of them had to do with the topic, so... I appreciate you guys so much for tuning in. Um, sorry again that Mark was unable to join us today. Uh, he'll be back on Wednesday. And then, um, yeah, we're just continuing doing what we're doing here. Uh, if you are interested in joining our online membership where you can get people working with you on a daily basis, our professional coaches that 
do a phenomenal job. We just had a, a crew finish the seven day foundations course who have moved into the 60 day max vertical course. Um, and just the feedback and the improvements that are seen in those courses are are huge. So uh, if you want us to be a part of your journey, we would love to be a part of it. Just shoot us an email um, and we can get you going. Um, we we do once again about our camp in St. Pete. We have sold out, but we were able to find another coach to come and we are filling a th maybe two or three more spots from our wait list. So if you are on our wait list, make sure that you're checking your email. You get 24 hours to respond. Uh, if you are extremely interested in joining camp, you can still email us. You can still get on that, on that uh, wait list, but our hotel block is sold out. Uh, so accommodations would be something that you would have to look into. And then finally, uh, we do have a couple more weekends open that are around the AVP season. We are starting to schedule some more events. So if you want us to come to somewhere in your neck of the woods where you have courts, where you have people that are willing to train, uh, all we need is 12 full day commits. And we will get you a coach out there. We'll run you through nine hours of awesome volleyball where you'll learn a lot. You'll take away some keys and, uh, you'll really figure out some, some ways to improve your game and start winning some more points. Um, we guarantee it. So, uh, and we just love meeting people. We love getting out and getting introduced to a couple more communities. So, uh, we are heading to Ozark in a couple weeks. Uh, I believe we have another New York turn, uh, New York clinic coming up, uh, and then Alabama. So uh, if you're in those areas, if you're interested in those clinics, shoot us an email at support at betterbeach.com. And, uh, and if you're not in those areas and you want us to come to your area, once again, just shoot us an email and we can get that started. Uh, started a conversation last week with a group in Dallas, and I, I think we'll end up going there in a couple weeks. So um, it happens quickly. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Greg. Oh, thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. Um, appreciate you guys tuning in. As long as you guys show up, we'll keep teaching. So um, I appreciate the kind words and uh, it, it keeps me coming back. So I appreciate you. Um, as always, uh, we'll see you guys on Wednesdays and uh, keep getting better. Keep working hard. Uh, if you like our YouTube channel, if you don't, if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe, please like, uh, follow everything, follow up, follow our personally Instagrams. Um, every type of support is amazing. And obviously, if you want us to be a part of your journey, please reach out. We'd love to help you guys. And we'll see you on the sand. We'll see you next time. Have a good day, guys.